ahead and get started. Welcome to the third and final webinar in our series on student-led civic engagement. Uh, this one is about state and university resources. In webinar one, we shared our observations on why a new form of civic engagement in schools is needed. This new form is a student-led version that equips students with the knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to take action as adults, starting now as students. Through both webinars one and two, we offered snapshots of what student-led civic engagement looks like, first at the district level, and then in webinar two at the classroom level. In doing that, we also unpacked what teaching and learning looks like in classrooms or programs that incorporate student-led civic engagement. We invite you to watch or rewatch those webinars in which we share in our follow-up email. Today, we want to help teachers, school, and district leaders prepare to create or grow programs that create these type of learning opportunities for students. Our panelists today have worked with principals and district leaders to help design and even spur the creation of programs that support student-led civic engagement. Um, I'm excited to welcome uh, both Michael and Chabong from the Democratic Knowledge Project at Harvard University, which works closely with the state of Massachusetts and districts to design a research-based approach to civic engagement. We'll also be joined by Christy Reyes, the lead facilitator for New York State Education Department's Civic Readiness Initiative, uh, that is also launching a pilot program for districts that will support student-led civic engagement this fall. And once again, my name is Nicole Brisbane. I'm a project director at CPEARL at Columbia University, a lawyer, education consultant, and always a middle school reading teacher at heart. Uh, I'm also joined by Kimberly, who is uh, my colleague at CPEARL. Um, she will be navigating any tech issues if they come up. Um, also the master playlist uh, DJ at CPEARL um, and generally just here to support if you need anything, let her know. Here's how we'll spend our time today. Uh, we will start by revisiting our working definition of student-led civic engagement uh, and name some of the ways this series has helped deepen our understanding of that definition. Uh, next, we'll shift to exploring the type of frameworks that can shape the design of learning experiences and programs that support student-led civic engagement with our guests. And to that end, we will meet with the, Dem the Democratic Knowledge Project at Harvard to discuss their framework and how DKP partners with districts and states. Then we will learn about the framework the New York State Education Department has created and how it is working to support districts. Uh, and then we'll close out with a preview of resources that we'll share in a follow-up email that we hope will support your work um, as you design um, student-led civic engagement programs in your schools and districts. Um, as questions come up throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A box uh, to drop your questions at any time, uh, and we'll be sure to try to get to them in the midst of our conversation. So let's begin by exploring our working definition of student-led civic engagement and what we have learned so far. Throughout this learning series, we've explored our working definition of the term student-led civic engagement. This definition was motivated by observations that we and others have had about a new wave of civic engagement that allows students to directly apply the knowledge, skills, values, and motivations needed to be democratically engaged by creating the space for students to select, explore, and act on the political, social, economic, and environmental issues that mean the most to them and their communities. Following this observation, we reviewed existing research and had conversations with practitioners and experts to think about what student-led learning means and looked at programs across the United States engaged in this type of work. After conducting the research, we arrived at the definition you see before you. The definition is a combination of two concepts, student-led learning and civic engagement. In creating this series, we met with district leaders, teachers, external partner organizations, and researchers who have shared what their program looks like as a way to help create some examples of student-led civic engagement. The series has helped us sharpen our understanding of how student-led civic engagement differs from, for example, civics classes. So far, we've learned that student-led civic engagement programs create learning opportunities across subject areas 
and not just in social studies classes, but also in after school, which we first heard about um, through the Youth Ambassadors Program, which is a component of Baltimore City Public Schools Be More Me program from the first webinar. Second, student voice is developed through these programs, but it also is built into the design and implementation of the program. For example, we saw with Chicago Public Schools Educating for Democracy program, they've built their program with student input and seek student feedback throughout. Third, these programs may have a single focus, like we saw in the Marine Affairs Policy Program at the Harbor School, or programs can be open-ended to allow students to identify issues that are important to them, which we saw in the Generation Citizen model. Lastly, these kinds of programs can be homegrown, meaning teachers, specialists, and other staff within a district or school can design the curriculum, like Baltimore City Public Schools did with their Be More Me program, or program leaders can partner with external organizations that support the design and or facilitation of the program or creation with instructional materials. Whether homegrown or developed in partnership with external organizations, the design of these programs is often informed by a framework and an aspect we have yet to discuss. So today's panelists will discuss the frameworks that inform their work and offer a behind the scenes peek at the design of their programs. If you've joined us for the webinars, you'll notice that today we'll speak to our guests individually rather than panel style. So we'll have an opportunity to focus on each of their frameworks that they've created. Again, as you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A box. All right, and I will stop sharing my screen now um, as we welcome our first guest from the Democratic Knowledge Project. Uh, Can I go to share the screen? Yes, let me uh, cancel this. <laughs> All right, okay. All Perfect. Right. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. All right. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chebong Nam and I'm so pleased to speak about the 10 questions for young change makers for, uh, framework with my colleague today, uh, Michael Blau um, at the Democratic Knowledge Project at Harvard University. And the DKP Democratic Knowledge Project is a research and practice lab working for curriculum development and research development, professional development and research and assessment especially about the civic education. So, and since we have a very short time, I'll just go through very quickly um, the slides. So what is the 10 questions framework? Uh, simply to say, that's a reflection and action tool for successful civic action. So then where does it come from? So it came from a multi-year research study done by MacArthur Foundations for uh, MacArthur Foundation's research network on youth and participatory politics. It's so about four year, uh, eight years. So basically, a number of scholars across the nation studied a one particular topic, how digital technology is reshaping the ways young people participate in politics. So they studied eight years. So you may guess that we have a lot of findings. And I just want to introduce a few important findings. So first, Authenticity matters. So basically, uh, authenticity matters for uh, young people's participation. Basically, their genuine interest in hobbies, music, art, pop culture, or fan club, or their personal interests play a key role in young people's civic participation, which is beyond the realm of um, institution of a politics. Second, collectivism matters. So what is collectivism? Uh, basically, that's a lot about clicks in social media platform. There are some criticisms saying that social media is too transient, too volatile, so it doesn't lead us anywhere. Uh, but we disagree. From our observation and research studies, we found out that collectivism is a gateway um, experience leading to deeper civic engagement. So like, for instance, uh, Hashtag Black Lives Matter, think about them, Th something like that. And online safety becomes more and more important, especially in a digital age, it's really important and also difficult to have a full control over my own persona 
because in a digital RAM, there are a lot of leaking points for information. So how can you keep it safe, especially about our own like public versus civic, uh, public versus and person persona? And lastly, the distinction between voice and influence. This is like a very key concept for our uh, research project. So voice is basically about civic expression. So expressing our thoughts, opinions. It's very important on its count. But that's different from sort of influence, which is a type of action specifically targeting at a structural change or some kind of um, making changes in policy level. So both are working together. Both are very important for civic participation, but we need to understand the distinction between the two and the mechanisms different mechanisms between the two. So these are like some, some simple key findings and the key questions for us, the research project people uh, had was then how can, it, how can educators help young people navigate the challenges and opportunities of this new environment successfully for their civic participation? Then the 10 questions came from so whether you believe or not, it take about it took about like eight years for us to get to this point. So basically, um, we think that these are the most important ten questions for young people to think about when they design civic participation. So uh, let me read it just one by one very quickly. So question number one: What matters to me and why? And Number uh, question number two, how much do I share? How do I make it about more than myself? Where do we start? How can we make it easy and engaging for others to join in? How do we get wisdom from crowds? How do we handle the downside of crowds? Are we pursuing voice or influence or both? How do we get from voice to change? How can you find allies? So you may see or you may notice some kind of sequence as I read the 10 questions. So from my observation, um, I realized that sometimes people had, have a hard time absorbing all the 10 questions at once. But if we put these 10 questions into four different buckets, kind of it becomes a little bit easier. So basically first bucket is about uh, personal narratives and identity. We start from our own identity. It's about authenticity. And then we face the moments of pivoting from I to we. Then we need to think about wisdom of crowds, good crowds and bad crowds. Then we get to the point of like voice to influence. So these are simple sort of sequence, simple but intentional sequence. So simply is to say, again, the 10 questions are a tool to structure reflection and action for successful civic participation. Here's another key question for us. Hey, what do you mean by successful? So we have actually a very strong uh, theoretical foundation about successful. It means equitable, effective, and self-protective. Honestly, I can't go through everything about what these definitions mean, but I want to point you some kind of key points. So our 10 questions have intentional sequence and structure around these three values. So for instance, these are the questions. These are the questions like for instance, question number one, three, and six, seven, 10. They are touch basing uh, the issues of equity. Then efficacy, like the questions four, five, eight, nine, ten. So we think that these are touch basing of the issues of efficacy. And self protection. I know this is kind of new term, but it becomes a very important in a digital environment. So self protection piece is being related to questions two, six, seven, especially how much they share. This is very important point of reflection before they, before young people to think about their civic action. So all together, efficacy, equity, and self-protection all together, they're actually upholding each other. It's not separate from one another, rather 
they um, like hold the other to secure psychological integrity in the process of their civic participation. Um, I know it's a lot, but you can visit us later and also you can uh, give us more, uh, you can uh, have more questions after uh, this session. And the next piece is about um, some concrete application. So questions about, hey, I think I got 10 questions. It's quite interesting, but tell us more about how the 10 questions are being used. And then from here, I want to turn the mic over to Michael Blau, uh, who's my colleague here, and he's going to talk about the specific context of Massachusetts state mandate on human civics. Yeah. So, Mike. Mike. Thanks so much, Chabong. Um, and I realized I just sent a message. I put our website in the chat box, but I sent it only to panelists, I think. So actually, let me try to put that there. But Chabong's being a little bit modest too, but our, the DKP is really birthed out of this work with the 10 questions. And Chabong has been really integral to that work with Danielle Allen and uh, you know, the YPP based out of the ed school with Howard Gardner and a whole bunch of other great uh, folks. So, um, and it's years of research that has really built up to this kind of youth participatory model what we call student-led civics. Um, and I'll transition to how that has now impacted the context in Massachusetts in particular, since that's where we're doing almost all of our work right now. Um, and the Massachusetts context is really exciting and actually really novel uh, nationally right now. Um, so the Massachusetts uh, uh, legislature, um, along with DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, passed new standards for the first since for uh, first new st standards in history and social studies since 2001 and uh, in 2018 they released these and the new framework came out and it had a huge new emphasis on civics including an eighth grade civics class uh, that was a requirement um, so a full year course um, that was a requirement that same year this picture here is you know uh, uh, Charlie Baker Republican governor uh, with a whole bunch of Democratic uh, legislators behind him signing the uh, act to enhance civic engagement in in Massachusetts and part of that is a student-led civics uh, requirement once in eighth grade um, that has to be completed and offered to every student and then once in the high school year so it has to be yeah, students have to have the opportunity to complete that project uh, throughout their high school career, and then certainly in that eighth grade civics uh, course. Um, so student-led civics as defined um, in, by the state when the, in, in this law and clarified by DESE um, is uh, a real world civic learning opportunity that invites students to identify an issue that matters to them. As you, you'll see the parallels with the 10 questions here, an issue that matters to them uh, uh, and, and begin to work within their communities to investigate, bring a solution uh, make a plan, implement it, and reflect upon that 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 uh, process. So again, really relevant to the ten questions which we'll dive into. These should be authentic, informed, engaged uh, projects um, that help build what we think and we're betting on as the, as the DKP and our approach approach is uh, a healthy constitutional democracy and those civic skills, knowledge, and dispositions to uh, be able to be empowered in, in operating in our in our system. So. And then there's the requirements there at the bottom. What uh, something I'll, I'll note in a second um, too is uh, that we worked with uh, Generation Citizen and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in putting together a student-led civics project guidebook, which I'll also put in the chat in a moment, um, uh, in order to help guide districts and teachers in uh, implementing now those projects and the best practices. So. Um, and I'll just put it in the chat box right now, actually. So that was my next slide. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide uh, there. Please feel free to go check that out, uh, that resource out. Like I said, it was released two years ago. Um, and it, what it really does is breaks down um, the student-led civics project um, as, as defined by DESE um, into six different stages or steps. Um, step one is examine, examination of self and what we're, we call a civic identity. So a lot of our uh, eighth grade work that we put together for our eighth grade curricular materials and in our workbooks starts with the story of self, the self narrative, identifying civic identity or identities rather, um, whereas those multiple uh, 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 um, identities that form who students are and tap into authenticity and connect them importantly to others and especially their community in a, in a local way. 
Two is identifying uh, an issue that ma cares that that matters to the student, um, and this is a, a, a research oriented uh, investigatory process in step two. But obviously, in step three, is learning the research process of learning about and and you know giving inquiry to local leaders or or decision makers, uh, power brokers around uh, uh, finding out more about that issue. Step four is developing an action plan, really important uh, and uh, challenging for, for young folks, but a really important step, um, which I can say more about in, in question and answer. Um, step five is actually taking action. So this might look like uh, actually reaching out to your school admin or your local leaders, your uh, city council, your school board, your uh, cafeteria manager, who, you know, depending on what the students are, are really interested and engaged in. Um, that's what the, the action portion is, and it can be really rewarding, if, even if it's just sending an email, talking on the phone, getting a meeting. Um, and then reflecting, um, uh, and, and this is where Chabong's uh, 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 approach and framework for uh, efficacy and, and self-protection and equitability all come into play, and students should be pushed to uh, really think about um, to what degree did they have success and what did they learn? Uh, and, and in the process of this, this is all to say that the process is the learning experience. It's not necessarily reaching the, uh, the, the actual end goal. And so you can see here that our 10 questions align with these uh, six stages as la la laid out in the, the DESI guidebook um, and in this, uh, in this framework. Um, and so we try to hold true to this, this kind of process um, and the 10 questions really help shepherd students through that, that, that uh, framework. Great, uh, next one's Chabon. So what have we done to help support teachers in Massachusetts through this? Chabong and our team have put together a student-led civics workbook, which I can put in the chat as well. Um, but this is an online, it's a Google site, it's interactive, it's student facing, um, teachers use it as well, um, and it helps students walk through the 10 questions essentially, um, gives them tons of templates and uh, lessons around uh, media literacy for research, um, and uh, who to reach out to, how to reach out, what kind of templates they can have for crafting emails to decision makers, how they can find an issue that they care about. That's actually a really hard part of the project to build inertia to, which I can say more about also. But um, tons of resources in there about uh, how to get students uh, started in that process and follow those six stages um, and engage with those 10 questions, um, which is really a in great inquiry-based way to uh, navigate a student-led civics project that's authentic uh, to them. So, um, in there, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, our, our certain milestones, our, our, um, our, uh, uh, some formative assessments, uh, like I said, media literacy, some local tools. It's all Massachusetts centric right now. So I know we're talking to a New York, mostly New York group, um, but, um, uh, so, but we hope to be able to expand upon that. And we hope to be able to uh, be able to uh, make this widely more available and uh, general um, in the future. So, um, like I said, I'll put that in the chat box here. And I think for time reasons, let's go ahead and jump into uh, questions. Nicole, I know you had a few that you wanted to lead off with. Yes, um, that was awesome. And I know when we first spoke, I was really intrigued by the 10 questions framework. Um, and so thank you for sharing that with um, our audience today. I think it, you know, even though your, your work is mainly in Massachusetts, like you said, that framework is uh, interesting and can expand across obviously any geography. So uh, thanks for sharing that with us. And it seems like your resources are adaptable. So even, yeah. even, even better. Um, yeah, so I, I had a uh, Nicole. Can can I just add a, just one quick information about us? So we said uh, 10, que 10 questions for young change makers, but I just want to say that we use the term change makers um, as cross ideological terms. So you may notice that. A lot of um, student-led civics projects or student-led civics initiatives are sometimes criticized as a left-leaning uh, agenda. But we mm. sort of um, uh, we we disagree with that. Actually, students, regardless of any students, regardless of their ideological spectrum, anyone can be a change makers. So I just want to uh, highlight that. That's important. Thank you. We we certainly have come across um, some of that 
um, in terms of the research that we did, yes. um, you know, preparing the next generation of, of liberals is what some articles have said. But um, I do think that it's an important distinction and, and one that, um, you know, as, as students get more and more and more interested in, in what's happening around them and develop opinions about what's happening around them, there certainly is some stickiness that comes along with that. Um, so I'm sure that's something that, uh, that districts and schools have to think about, especially um, as it relates to preparing yes. teachers to handle these conversations. Um, and actually, I'll just ask that question. Do you all have any supporting professional development that you do uh, with districts? Uh, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you partner uh, with a district or a school and what that partnership may look like. Yes, that's absolutely. Michael, I think he's an expert sure. in the area. So Michael. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 what's really important to say is that we've co-designed and co-developed everything with educators. And so that makes us really unique um, in that we didn't start out with a curriculum shop and, and produce these things. Um, we have people that are experts in the research and the literature around student engagement um, and around youth participatory politics, youth participatory action and research. Um, but we've paired with teachers um, really importantly to help build out everything. And that's also to say that we in our uh, starting out with, with uh, the, these new frameworks since 2018, we've been piloting uh, uh, really, really uh, intentionally with districts um, in Massachusetts from a broad array of, of, of districts, uh, geographically, demographically, uh, like Chafong said, across a political spectrum in order to try to um, fine tune um, how students interact with these 10 questions, but also all of our materials. And so we've worked with a pilot group in the eighth grade for in, in particular for the last two years around um, really implementation of, of, of student-led civics projects, but also what's really important to note, and we've been uh, really involved with this, uh, Chabong and I, is providing professional development through state mechanisms. So the, with the, the Act to Enhance Civic uh, Learning and Engagement Act that was passed in 2018, it actually, another thing that was really novel about it is that it, it founded a, a, tr a trust fund, a private, private public trust fund really for um, civic uh, 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 training and professional development for educators. So there's $1.5 million in there that is uh, uh, being provided by the state to DESE in order to run those trainings. And so they, they had two rounds, we're a part of them both times, two rounds of civic and teaching and learning grants. Um, and we applied as vendors with uh, a number of districts in order to help provide support um, for uh, their development in the 10 questions. Uh, our, we have peer organizations that were also part of different uh, grant grants, um, and, and so that's how, in Massachusetts at least, that 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 context has really helped, really speed up professional development and training in inquiry-based learning and civic participatory politics and student-led civics as a new kind of novel um, uh, framework that that is mandatory now in in Massachusetts. So. That's uh, been really successful. Um, we've done a lot of great professional development with that. And, it, and it's been extremely rewarding because it's, well, we should say this too, it's a, a part of our, our reason it, for existence is a word. We're, we're in two or three generations deep of uh, disinvestment from civic education. And so that's felt all the way up into the, uh, the, 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 uh, the generation of teachers that, that we work with, a lot of them have been teaching ancient civ for the last 20 years, literally, or um, not teaching uh, uh, civics and government at all. And so they're rusty and they really need uh, some more help in talking through, thinking about knowledge, skills, and dispositions in, in civics. And so that's been a, people have been really hungry for that. And so that's been a great, uh, a great need to fill in, in, over the last two or three years. Awesome. Uh, Kimberly, it looks like we had a question or two in the chat. Did you want to share those with us? Absolutely. In the interest of time, I'm going to try and combine these questions. So uh, apologies to everyone who has asked a question and appreciation for allowing me to sort of combine these. And I think there's a question around, you know, we're working at this level of a framework, partnering with the state so that this type of learning takes place in, in classrooms. And so I think there, there is a question about, what does teacher involvement look like in this process? And then relatedly, what might they be doing in their classrooms as well? If you could get both of those answers in. Yeah, can I just jump in quickly sure. about that? 
So um, I would say that, so we only talk about student-led civics project here, but actually um, our student-led civics project is part of a part of a year long curriculum. So, um, so it's important for teachers to understand a broader context of why we teach student-led civics. It's not just about action because um, it's uninformed action sometimes it's dangerous. So students have to understand knowledge and skills and they put all those skills and knowledge at the end into the creation of their civic action project. So we closely work with a teacher. So like um, uh, Michael just mentioned, we have a group of um, community of practice teachers. So we basically like uh, doing a lot of uh, lit literally like a very active uh, feedback loop for like revising and revising, creating a new curriculum for student life civics project. So teacher, school admin, and also state. And also we have like a close, a close relationship with other civil societies, civic education organizations, like a generation citizen facing history. So it's really important to put us in a broader context of a civic education. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks, Javon. So it, it, it's definitely a, an extremely unique and phenomenal environment that we've built right now in Massachusetts with the peer organizations we have with DESI really being at the table with everything. And then our teachers are really a part of our team. They are part of our curriculum team. So we, when it's, when you asked, how do we pull in teachers to that work there, when they're part of the community practice uh, with us and or we're doing PD with, like we had said, with through grants with uh, uh, Chabong and I, with uh, different districts around student-led civics projects, they're coming back to us with a whole bunch of feedback. Of, I did this, I changed this, I iterated this. Um, and uh, this is working for me, this is not working for me, especially in the yeah. remote context. This year, we've had a whole lot of challenges mm -hmm. um, in implementing student-led civics projects, right. and we knew that would be a challenge, but we're lear we learned an incredible amount from teachers implementing it. We know that the projects are really doable online, uh, in, in some ways more successful and like getting in guest speakers or other things like that, um, and we're learning that from teachers through their implementation re remotely and now a little bit in hybrid as we get into to May here, so. Yeah. Just want to add a little bit. So openness is, is a key. Uh, basically, we work with a lot of um, teachers and teachers from a different school district. So basically, we just say that, you know, student led civics project is for all, not just for one particular group of students, but it's for all. And you can pursue your own goals with your own authenticity. So share your thoughts. And also, this is about process. Teachers need to learn. They also need a time to learn and grow. So our professional development for the first year is to support those first steps. Awesome. Well, we're going to um, flip over to uh, Christy so we get to hear a little bit of the New York perspective. Thank you so much. We hope you'll hang around. Yes. Um, just yeah, in case there you. are a few additional questions um, at the end. Um, but I'd love to introduce uh, Christy Radez from uh, New York State Education Department. Um, the Civic Readiness Initiative. Um, Christy, we are uh, getting ready to launch um, a quite exciting uh, initiative here in New York. Uh, things are just kicking off. You're about to launch a pilot in the fall. Um, and um, I'd love to hear, you know, just from your perspective, you know, what brought about this program? Uh, why now for New York? And if you'll tell us just a little bit about it, and then we can do some Q&A as well. Okay, sounds good. I'll just run you through these slides and then we should have time for any outstanding questions. Um, so what brought us here was really when we saw the national implementation of Common Core for math and ELA and social studies was left out of that for a variety of, of reasons, but that was very concerning for um, social studies educators. And immediately the New York State Board of Regents saw that concern. And at the same time, they were working on their reform efforts to try to close the opportunity gap that we also saw in New York and were concerned about this you know, persistent um, opportunity gap for our students of color. And when we looked at the research of how can we close that gap and we looked at this you know, math and ELA um, emphasis from Common Core, we came to the conclusion that we really, the Board of Regents and the Commissioner need to put an emphasis back into social studies and civics, which we feel is really the main purpose of education. So what they were able to do at the time was put together a, a group of educators and experts, and they wrote the new social studies framework, which 
We based in large part on the C3, which was a national effort of similarly minded people with the same issues I just discussed sort of across the nation saying, oh no, they left out social studies. We have to do something to remind everybody that this is the why of education, that we are really the ones who engage students and all of the 21st century skills that you need to be an active citizen come through social studies. So we took the C3, the educators and, and um, stakeholders worked together. And in 2014, the New York State Board of Regents adopted the New York State for Social Studies framework. And this was a shift um, towards skills and in specific civic participation. When we then adopted the Every Student Succeeds Act in New York, the region saw that as the opportunity to shift our core mission statement from just make the students college and career ready to prepare students for college, career, and citizenship. And that was very validating for us in the social studies community because to become a citizen, to be, have your civically ready skills, you need social studies. So through that mission statement, the board also went a step further in our ESSA plan and said, when we say civic readiness, we want to see it as a measurement in our accountability. We want to see that civic readiness is part of your school quality, your student success and your school accountability. So they had this big picture goal that we really want civics to matter. And we wanna put the teeth behind it that we can, that we're allowed to do now that we have these multiple measures in the ESSA plan. So through that, they convened our Civic Readiness Task Force in 2018. And that was a group of educators, stakeholders, um, but also civic leaders across New York State. Um, we had jury commissioners, board of election um, administrators. We had uh, Michael Rebell was our chairman, who's um, notably you know, won the CFE case for um, fair funding for New York City public schools. So we had people who have been working for decades who were very committed to strengthening our civic readiness and taking this opportunity that was given to us by the Board of Regents to make this meaningful. So we came up with three recommendations through uh, about a year and a half of work of our 33 member task force. And the first thing we had was our definition. And you'll see that um, this is going to seem very similar to the previous um, presentation because we used their research as one of our platforms for building our um, resources. So both, you know, the, the 10 steps to be a change maker, but also the um, civic mission for schools, six proven practices are all weaved throughout here. So civics itself isn't new. We know that there's many, many decades of research that says this is what works. What we're trying to do is just reaffirm, invigorate civics and allow K through 12 instructional space for social studies through this. So within our four domains, we have civic knowledge um, and that is to reemphasize instructional time in foundations of government, geography, culture and economics. The skills in action, one of the most important, especially now news literacy, um, being able to think about sources and bias and claims. So these are all weaved into our social studies framework, also in this civic readiness definition, and also will be part of our new New York State Regents exams for social studies going forward. Those Regents exams have been redesigned to reflect these new standards. Um, civic mindsets, which is just the understanding that we are part of a democracy. And with that comes some mutual um, respect and understanding that we are working together towards a, a diverse um, community that respects each other's freedoms. Finally is our civic experiences. And this is really just allowing students opportunities to participate. So here in New York, we have a graduation requirement, a half credit course that is entitled participation in government. But um, when we just did some initial surveying, we found that there are students who take that class and get that credit, but never actually um, participate in government. And we want to change that. Our second recommendation was our civic capstone project. So we laid out all of the different models um, across the state. We had Generation Citizen, I know you've mentioned, they, we had a representative um, on our task force we looked at work from the MICVA challenge that also partners with some of our districts and also some of the um, homegrown work that we had 
already existing in our state. So for example, um, Syracuse City School District had combined our half of credit of participation in government and half a credit of economics. And they made an action citizenship class where totally inquiry-based covering the same content principles, but through the lens of essential questions in civics. So all of those models we looked at boiled down and said, they're all good in their own way, but here's what they all have in common. So we are very much locally controlled. This is up to local districts, but here's our guiding principles. If you do create a capstone that we see in common with all of the best practices. And this is our third um, recommendation. It's the seal of civic readiness. So the seal of civic readiness can be two things in New York. It can be a golden seal on your diploma that acknowledges that you are civically ready upon your graduation because you have um, participated in these activities. But it can also be a replacement for a regents exam because we are implementing our pathway program. And at our last May Board of Regents meeting, the board approved the concept of a civics pathway. So a plus one instead of your fifth regents exam would be that you earned this seal. So what you're looking at is fairly extensive, but this is not a checklist. Um, this is a menu of options. So a student needs to earn a total of six points on this seal, at least two points on the civic knowledge side and two points on the civic participation side with, for a total of six. Um, so the left-hand side is fairly straightforward. We're primarily focusing on the importance of social studies, coursework, and content. The right hand side is becomes much longer. And that's because we had long conversations about opportunity gaps in civic participation, um, civic deserts, you know, the, the varied opportunities of not every school has a speech and debate club, not every school has civics as an extracurricular. So we thought if we put all of these things that we say are valuable on this list, and then we let schools make their own plans of how their students can best meet the seal, this would make it accessible for all students. So we were really thinking about equity when we um, wrote this up and that's why the list sort of got longer and longer, but there was a fair argument to be made for all of these activities and we've sort of weeded them out by points. So for example, being in an extracurricular club would not be worth nearly as much as completing a full capstone project. Um, but it is something to be a part of United Nations is, is something effective. So we do want to put some credit there for that. So this seal of civic readiness then is a total of six points for students. Um, and we also made it a point to say that these projects can be done individually or in small groups or as a whole class. Um, and for two reasons, one, that is how civics work in reality, you know, building consensus and working with teams. Um, but also in terms of our culturally responsive sustaining education framework, we think about how brains work differently and that students who come from a more collectivist culture um, are going to flourish. And this is about building civic agency. So when we think about building everybody's civic agency, we think about allowing opportunities for collectivist cultures to thrive and allowing students to work together to work off of each other's strengths because that will make some students more comfortable and will allow them to really fully participate in this and, and use those skills outside of high school. In terms of resources, um, there are a plethora and these are just some of the few that we recommend because these are free, um, they're nonpartisan and we find that, you know, if teachers are just looking for a place to start, these have ready-made printable lessons, game, iCivics in particular, if you have iPads or Chromebooks, they have plenty of games um, to get students engaged as a starting place. Um, and I also included some New York state specific resources. So we have Novel New York, which is something the state pays for every New York state um, resident or whoever happens to be on a computer in New York gets free access to our um, databases, paid for databases. So for example, Opposing Viewpoints is an excellent resource that's available on that website. We also have our New York state archives who have been working with the New York State Framework to make inquiries to help support teachers. And I put one example of um, the history of racism and oppression against Latinos in New York, 
but they have, again, they have a whole um, social justice page with multiple inquiries that teachers could select from. Um, we also, when we initially adopted the framework, we created a toolkit and that was a collaboration with the authors of the C3 framework. So that's also available for free online. And um, when we look at our seal, we have the civics project up on top that's worth one and a half points. And we think that these toolkits are a nice fit for that um, seal because every inquiry, when you look at it, ends with taking informed action, creating a PSA, creating an argument for campaign finance reform, or um, whatever it is that the student cares about, because obviously student voice and choice are very important in this, but that we give, um, we use these as an opportunity for students to earn points on the seal. So when these first came out, um, teachers loved them, but they felt like these are going to take me to two weeks. I don't know if I would have the time or how would I justify it. But now we're hoping with the seal, there's a good, there's your justification. Um, and these are some articles just in support of social studies because I know people are planning for September and are extremely stressed about, you know, I'm already hearing about learning loss. And um, it, I think these are just nice reminders to center ourselves on why we bring um, social studies into our classroom and how that really enhances literacy, but it also enhances, you know, intangible benefits like empathy um, that we want to build in our students. So if a student has no place to start and is looking for um, how do I get connected to groups, you know, the most important thing is for them to find their passion, think about what it is they care about, something that they see in you know, where they live that they would like to change. Um, once they find their, that, it's fairly easy to connect to outside community organizations. In New York, we have Democracy Ready New York, and the whole purpose of this organization is to help connect students to civic um, participation activities. This um, website I put up here is from the US government and similar missions. So, um, so there's multiple opportunities to connect students to organizations inside and outside of school. And I should also mention, you know, if, if a student chooses and has a place of worship, that there are faith-based organizations as well that students can go to and engage in meaningful civics activities. So we don't see this as something that's solely the ownership of social studies, although it's rooted in social studies. There's places students go, at, you know, with their families outside of school that are also valuable. Um, so for a district who's look, thinking about their first steps of offering the seal, or even just becoming a part of our civic readiness initiative, um, I would recommend looking at our social studies framework, um, looking at our civic readiness definition, but in specific, if you're thinking about the seal, and I should mention, um, the seal earns the students the regents credit, but it also for, for school districts on our index, our Office of Accountability Measures, it doubles a school score. For every student who earns the seal, your school gets two points per that student versus the regular one point they would get for just a student who graduated with a regents diploma. So um, we didn't mandate this, but we've done everything short of that. We're incentivizing it for the student, we're incentivizing it for the district. So districts who are interested then would look at their stakeholders. Um, we've put together a manual that explains all of the details and I'll include that of how you form a seal of civic readiness committee, how you determine whether or not your extracurriculars count or what electives might count. Um, but essentially it's going to be, is this moving students civic agency forward under the guidelines of our civic readiness definition? Um, But I do want to emphasize I, the SEAL is going to get a lot of, of attention and rightfully so, it's exciting. And we are starting our pilot in the fall. And even in the middle of a pandemic, we had um, over 130 applicants to be a part of this pilot. So we, um, we think that this is going to be beneficial for students and we're really excited to see the real, it's all hypothetical right now, but this school year, we're going to get student samples, we're going to get teacher feedback. So we can't wait for that. But I also do want to emphasize that civic readiness for us is a K through 12 initiative. And if you look at our social studies framework in New York, this is the example of civics in starting in kindergarten, you know, letting kids know that they have self-worth, that they have the right to be protected from 
bullying, from neglect, from abuse. They have the right to an education um, and that they have a responsibility to protect the welfare of the group so that when they're serving as line leader or cleaning up for the center, that those things are important and teaching them that they're helping our society by being responsible leaders. And the earlier on that they have that self-worth and confidence and empathy to engage in society on that level, they can bring those skills up through till high school when we hope they all participate in our civics capstone and earn our seal of civic readiness. That's all. Thank you, Christy. I, uh, that was super helpful. Um, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the pilot, just in terms of how it's structured and um, what you're hoping, you know, will come from that, that you will be able to share out with the rest of the districts across the state. Yeah, so we, um, we put together that menu of options. And now we have given that to our pilot schools. We'll officially announce our pilot schools June 1st. But what we're going to do is I've assigned a regional um, supervisor to three to five districts and they'll work together to create common um, rubrics. Right now, you know, we have the research project, we have the civics project, but we need the, the examples, the rubrics, how do you grade these, what do you count? So we'll have all of that information. And as we're going through, we'll see if there's anything we forgot, if our point system seems a little off, um, and then we can really finalize it with the data and evidence, you know, that it was effective. But also my, my hope is by the end of it, that I will just have like a how-to guide of like, here's the PowerPoint you show your faculty to get by in, and here's really effective ways of greeting students if you're doing the civics project. So the pilot is, um, I'm so grateful to these schools because they're the ones who are gonna really do the hard work of like initially bringing our hypothetical into the classroom and having the students give us their samples and feedback, so. Awesome. Uh, it looks like we may have a question in the chat, Kimberly. Do you want to share it with the group? We do. It's a pretty big question. So given time, I'm going to try and carve this a little bit. And actually, Christine, I wanted to pick up on something that you said um, while you were sharing your overview, which is we're getting ready to come into the fall. And there are a lot of things on people's mind, including learning loss. And so the question in the chat is around like anticipated growth. And I wonder if you could sort of leave us on an inspiring note here of like, what are some of the biggest growth hopes or gains that you've actually seen at, in re, as a result of this type of student-led civic engagement? Yeah, I always say, um, you know, in terms of the other disciplines, they provide skills and tools for the 21st century, but social studies provides the why, why we care. And when you think about, you know, what kids have been through this year, what they've witnessed in terms of racial injustices, in terms of living through a pandemic, you know, social studies is the, the space, the safe place where they're gonna come and be able to talk about, be vulnerable, you know, respectfully disagree, and really build, you know, their civic agency of who they are, what they value, and how they can contribute to society. And when they see something that they don't think is wrong, they won't feel powerless. They'll feel like, okay, I'm glad I came to school today because now I learned how I'm going to make a difference and how I'm going to take all these things I learned and make it better for my kids. So I feel like social studies this year of all years is it, it is our year because I think that we are really you know there to make a difference for kids and I'm so thrilled that we're going to have this civic readiness initiative. And I'll just ask one last final question to our guests from DKP. Um, if you were speaking to a district that is uh, just thinking about designing their program um, and they're looking for sort of a place to start. What advice do you have for them in terms of building something in-house, um, you know, for their students? Um, yeah, I would start. I would start with the social studies framework in our toolkit. The toolkit is all done for you. You know, it's just um, compelling questions that you print out, and you you have conversations with the kids. I also included um, facing history in ourselves, and I, I think they do an, an excellent job of keeping up with current events. And I think we need to make some space for that. Like I, I would definitely be talking about, um, you know, if I was in social studies today, I'd be talking about um, Asian American, you know, the violence towards Asian Americans and like the centuries of racism. And these are things that kids are really, they're seeing it and they're feeling it. And I think it's really important that we give them the context and space to productively think about it, talk about it. 
So for us, for DKP, I just want to be very specific because about the resource, the DKP Civic Action Workbook, actually that's uh, being created for that particular purpose. We really want to share our resources with teachers, educators, and school admins. So actually the workbook is actually, uh, the workbook has all elements of um, supporting those materials. So actually they can pick up those materials and they can just pick and choose and they can reorganize, they means teachers and educators. They can reorganize those resources to serve their own context, so. Yeah, I, so combining those two, I would say something very similar is like, rule one, don't reinvent the wheel. We have some resources that we're continuing to improve and work with educators to uh, build out. Um, and there's like, uh, like Christine said, there, there, there's a lot of peers in this space. So facing history, I civics, generation yes. citizen, uh, teaching for justice. Now I think they renamed. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of great organizations that have done a whole, a whole lot of work in this space in the last few years, and connect it importantly to civic knowledge and the content pieces that are really needed to have the informed action. So, and and so that would be one thing. And the other thing for getting started is definitely connect uh, to what's 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 most authentic and and current and uh, relevant in students lives so uh, like christine said that you know there's a bunch of resources out there with connecting with current events or traumatic events obviously we've, we've had a lot of those in the last year um so uh, unfortunately but those are good places to start conversation and to really draw students into an authentic place to be mm -hmm. engaged and talk about their values and what they care about and why they care about it and then equip them with the tools that they need to actually do something about it um or try or try to and, and start that process and, because we're all learning how to how to how to impact our community around us and also they all need well, to we think you are so mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 so uh, we basically we all need a time to grow. Yeah. Yeah. This has been an excellent conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us today and sharing your frameworks and resources and all of the hard work that you've done to uh, get your programs up and running and to support districts and schools doing this work. Um, we are going to be sharing uh, with our participants who registered today um, some resources where you all can learn more about the Democratic Knowledge Project, and we will link to the things that they've shared in the chat today. Uh, you can read more about NYSED's Civic Readiness Initiative, um, explore some of the resources that they've shared with us, um, and then check out a few additional partners and online sources for instructional materials. And then we will link to webinars one and two uh, in case you'd like to watch or rewatch them. So thank you all again for joining and we hope you have a great rest of your day.